welcome everyone. And I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to continue our conversations about the journey of board members and chief executives and preparing for that great responsibility. I'm Mark Thompson. I'm CEO of the CEO Academy, a SHRM company that's a partnership with Wharton and McKinsey. And I'm so honored and delighted to have with me one of my greatest mentors, Ram Sharam, the legendary management thinker. And he inspires me every week as I read the voluminous amount of insights that he brings to boardrooms and to chief executives and those preparing for those functions. And was inspired again this week with a, a, a conversation that you started on leading at the helm, the five crucial steps for every new CEO. And those included uh, in a blog that you've written recently, Ram, um, the um, five steps that I'd love to cover today. So again, thank you for being with us uh, on today's program. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Your questions are very penetrating. They make me think. I like them. We should continue to do that. Well, I'm, I'm inspired, and so we will. We'll schedule the next one after we do this one. And I'd love to start sure. with where you started, um, being the lifelong learner and being inspired by these deep questions that you're talking about, you talked as the new CEO prepares for that role and uh, is in the seat. My, my main function as a CEO coach is actually helping people in, in advance think about the function and then of course manage those first 100 days. You were talking about how the first step was to engage and learn and really think about conversations in a, in a new and deeper way. Can you, can you talk about what that means to you? Yeah, I think uh, anybody can take any sequence of any step. <laughs> a human being is a more integrated package mm. than linear pixels on a television. Mm. So all of us have a different way to mix our things, to talk, to listen, to elicit, to, to elicit and so you go any way you want to go in, in real life. And so there are certain minimum imperative. If you get, when you get into the job, what to do? And before you get to the job, what you got to prepare for? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it also depends what you have been doing in the past. Because preparation for one person is not the same as another one. But there are some common elements that can help you as a minimum package. That makes sense. So, so that's the way we need to go. Because we know I can give you five elements, but their mix is different in every person. And the combination is infinite. Yes. Because each of them has zillion variations. So somehow the mind sorts out and say, what is the actual package for you, for me, for Dennis or anybody else? Right. So that's what we've got to keep in mind, what that is. So I want to give you some key things. Now, first we should tell the audience, what are those five? Could you recite those five? Yes. The First, really is wonderfully prompted by the way you just started, which is engage and learn is the first principle, because what I'm hearing you say now is about starting a conversation, a deep dive into a conversation, which is something, as you say, is necessary to think about it in a thoughtful way as a conversation, not a directive, not a prescripted thing, because we could all approach it, especially high achievers are going to approach this in many different ways. So to be open hearted and listening and, and engaged and learn, that's the principle number one. The second principle is choosing a formidable leadership team. In other words, right people in the right jobs, get the people in the right seats as Jim Collins used to tell me at Stanford. And so that principle of making sure you have that dream team and you assemble, recruit and develop those people for that role. Third is decision priorities, addressing the most critical unmade decisions. And I love how you frame that because the conversation about decisions often surprises people because we often don't decide 
who has the role and who has the decision-making rights. And so really thinking about those critical unmade decisions. Fourth is a vision for tomorrow. What's that larger map for the future? Uh, I think every board that hears uh, either of us uh, join a board session and say, you're at a crossroads, it resonates for them because every organization's at a crossroads with needing a, a better, more durable, as you said last time, a more durable strategic vision. And then finally, on this list of five, is true financial mastery. Now that may seem basic to some who might've gone to business school or been working on a PL because that's often how you get in this role. But what you're talking about is understanding and managing your capital efficiently. And I'm certain that means also risks associated with it and thinking about, frankly, where to take the long and the short bets uh, in terms of uh, that financial mastery. So engage and learn, right people, right jobs, decision priorities, vision for tomorrow, and financial mastery. So I'm going to take one at a time. Thank you. And I would say to you, they are imperatives, but not sufficient. Mm. There are more for every job, for every person, for sure. in every country, in every industry. So one should not take this as a recipe. Totally there, it's not. The first one is very comprehensive. That if you are not learning, you won't have, you won't be able to do the other four. Right. <laughs> and so when you're learning, you open the door of your mind. All of us have biases. All of us have preconceived notions. All of us have strong views. You particularly search opposite views. Mm -hmm. If you're not searching it, you won't get there. Right. You search different views. You segregate facts from opinions. But do seek opinions. Opinions of judgment. People who have good judgment. Now, in learning, very first thing you got to learn, who is the customer who's going to pay your check? Why would he do that? And you got to go to the ground level, not some fancy PowerPoint. <laughs> Most people who are not coming from selling don't get it. Mm. Yeah, so it's a disconnect with the fundamental reason people write the check and take the risk of their reputation to buy from you. Makes I sense. keep saying, I, I had one the other day, young man who has a very high potential. He got a new job I've never done in a very large company. Mm -hmm. He's on a, on a fast track. So when he sat down with me and I said, who's going to pay your paycheck? This is internal. He didn't know that. I said, you do. I said, who's your customer? He said, I make an input to so-and-so inside the company. I said, he's your customer. Did you talk to him? No. <laughs> so you got to know who is your customer, who's going to pay your check. That's not enough. For that, you got a B minus. <laughs> right. You got to figure out who's going to use your services. In many cases, person who pays the check is not the person who's going to use it. Hmm. Practice it now. Mm -hmm. Right. So most CEOs who are business to business miss this point. Mm -hmm. In the case of a B2B CEO, then you're saying then that it might be that, uh, you know, they need to know, of course, one of their customers is, is their boss, the board. Uh, one of their customers is uh, the, uh, the people that they need to motivate. And you're saying, most importantly, if they were a B2B company, they may not actually even know the people who actually. Yeah, because you're selling to another company. Right. And that company uses your inputs that go into a bigger product. Right. And so you say, who's going to use it? Right? Yes. Because that's what matters, even mm -hmm. though that user does not pay your check. But it should influence your decision on the design performance of the product. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, these are all common sense things. But common sense is very uncommon. <laughs> yes, indeed. I, was, uh, I would applaud that for sure. <laughs> the biggest people stumble on it. Because right. they use market research reports that don't personally go and observe the user. On the planet, my belief, Steve Jobs was the best observer of the consumer. Mm. We can argue that, but the evidence is clear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so being that at, as a primary directive to have that open heartedness to frame your, the approach to your role now as a new CEO, as being the learner, and that learning is much broader than the field of vision that we would have from our biases or our deep experiences that may in fact, and often are the reason why we got promoted anyway. Uh, and yet we're coming with a more limited field of vision than the one we had in our last job, if we were not a CEO coming from that last job. And then similarly, then we have to start to cast the characters on this new stage to think about the right people and the right jobs. What's, what's your advice about building that formidable team as you come in? Often the cliche is, you know, the, the new guy or gal brings yeah. their own team from the outside. I'd love to hear your insights. Yeah, there. there are two, two elements of that. One, at the higher levels, the skill that you have the right jobs, their architecture. Mm -hmm. Then you say, do you have the right people for each of these jobs. Yes. And then you say, how good is the match? Nice. So when I take a poll, most people tell me 25% of the people are in the wrong jobs. <laughs> Everywhere I go, it's normal. So I'm saying to the top three people, four people, eradicate that first. You can do that. But there's a second one. If the service to the user or the person who pays the check involves touch, employee touch, digital touch, mm. you go and see that personally. Experience it. That's right people in the right jobs. Mm -hmm. So Bezos used to do that in in, in in Amazon. So it's in print. So he was sitting in his one of those meetings and he had people sitting there and he asked somebody, how many rings it takes for the somebody to respond to the call? He picked up the phone. The answer was two. He picked mm -hmm. up nine. <laughs> now, Ouch. I don't know this, but I bet you money on it. He had done that checking earlier. He knew what the answer was. <laughs> right. Very smart. He has to. But yes, the, the big people do that. I, <laughs> I had one today, one of the largest companies in the world, and the CEO came halfway through the meeting. And I was with him yesterday on something else. And he just decided to call something and find out None of the people in the room knew it. And he said, the price of this was $30. We've been paying $90. None of them knew that. He just picked up and sampled it. What are we buying? Where are we buying? Picked up the phone, called somebody. He said, we paid 90. And he's horrified. He said, damn it, should be 30. <laughs> so much for Look good. Look at the difference. So you got to know where the action is. Mm -hmm. You got to sample it. You got to personally see it. Mm -hmm. And then say, why this is so? Is it a personal fault? Is there a process missing? Is there a particular job is wrong? Mm -hmm. Is the supervisory hierarchy line is not rightly staffed? Right. That is the 80%, 90% of success is on right people in the right jobs. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be the brightest. The right teams and the right jobs. 
The way we measure brightest is not relevant. You go the other way. Right. There are other ways to measure what brightness is. I believe a quarterback in football is a very bright person. But I'm not sure his IQ is 200. <laughs> I don't think so. And if he's winning Super Bowls, you don't care. You actually prefer that he be wise yeah. and smart and quick in all the ways that you're describing, which is why I love your you saying. You got it. You're qualified I got it. people based on their customer reaction, their awareness of what customers and what you should be paying for things, actually being engaged. That That's the point. Uh, you know, and Mark, you know, many of these athletes don't like studying. Yes. Many of these athletes hate it. Many of these athletes don't pass that exams yeah i don't blame but them they're superb they're superb in the game they yes. have intelligence yes that most of us will not match right that comes down to what you mean by the right people in the right jobs because you that's got it what i'm looking for that's where smartness happens <laughs> it's, when you've got so the right it's, it's well known that chairman of dupont came to apple in 1996, he found out Apple was going to go broke. Mm. I have been working with him, so we have gone talking to each other. Mm -hmm. He and I decided to sell, he decided to sell the company. I called two, two possible buyers. He called another two possible buyers. There were no buyers. And so he then brought his Steve Jobs back. And he said, I want to do product development and marketing. I want somebody to do the rest of it. That's how Tim Cook came. Yeah. He restructured the CEO job. Right. And he put his 1,000% energy on those two items. You know the outcome. Yes. So you're talking about the alignment of that role. Defining that role then was pivotal. That's a job. Job definition. Mm -hmm. He said, my job, I've got to do the peripheral stuff, board meetings and all that. Right. But I right. want to focus on those two things, period. I want the guy who will do supply chain, who will take care of other things. And he chose Tim Cook. Right. So right. I talked to him, Tim Cook's boss. I said, how did you let him go? At that time, <laughs> Apple is going broke. So Tim Cook said to his boss, I'll take a chance with this guy. Hmm. This is 1999 or so. Yeah. But Steve Jobs had been famous earlier. Sure. But the company is broke. He takes a chance. Here is Tim Cook. And he, he, was grew. Right. he grew. He and grew. He grew. They had the right role. Was, he was in logistics in a 3% margin business. Yeah. He is running... 40% gross margin business, which is a trillion dollar market value. He grew. Yeah. You want those right people. All the difference in the world. And I love how you're, you're framing it. If you were to pin me down, I wouldn't worry about the other three. Just <laughs> these two. Right, right. Get, that, get those right and the rest of these will flow. And in fact, then it, it flows perfectly because as you described it, I was thinking about how making the right decision priorities and, and addressing the, the critical decisions that haven't been made. Um, it's certainly... going to flow from the first two. Right, exactly. Yeah, Mark, I work with billionaires across the globe. Yes. Japanese, Brazilians, Australians, Canadians, Americans, Indians, people in Dubai. It is the first two that is dominant. Mm -hmm. Michael Dell personally told me, I didn't have a vision. It grows on me, Un unquote. He has a vision, but we start to sit down one day and dream. Hey, it doesn't happen that way. No. They have a dream of a product, of a service, of a customer, but they're not what we put a PowerPoint that in 25 years, I will be a trillionaire. <laughs> yeah, I remember Jason. Jason saying, I just want to figure out a way to make the software better because it sucks. 
How can I make it work for the customers as they build their That's business right. for tomorrow? <laughs> you look at Jason Huang. Mm. He said at Stanford, he said, I clean toilets of all of you combined. <laughs> he was nobody. And yeah. he very humble that way. He figured this out. He was nearly bankrupt. The concept worked. And the concept in a right way took off. Yes. But the hurdles he went through, hurdles he went through, are critical. And he had to get the right people to help him do that. But he learned a lot. What is there? What is not there? How do I get it? The first chip was terrible. Discarded. Mm -hmm. That is learning. And not giving up. But you think he had a vision to be a trillion dollar company? You're wrong. No way. No way. Yeah. He had a vision. If you succeed, what it could do for the customer, which customer to the industry, that for sure he had it. That gave him the conviction. I'm going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of those examples. Yes. Bezos has 60 failures. Six zero. But his vision was every customer will be personalized. His vision was it includes the most convenient. His, his vision was it's going to be faster. It's going to be cheaper. Hey, you can measure that. Yes. Now, if it's going to be a trillion dollar company, if we are right, it might. But he never says it's going to be a trillion dollar company. Never. He's always, always open. Customer, customer, customer. Faster, better, cheaper. Faster, better, cheaper for the customer. So it's all there. Yeah, it's, it's all It's measurable. There. It is. And, and, and how to get he there, didn't know a damn thing. Correct. He didn't know a damn thing about business. He learned. Yes. He recruited people who taught him. Mm -hmm. So there's a very good story, Mark. This is at the time when he's personally assembling the books in a box. Just think of those back, days. Back when Amazon he, was just uh, uh, going to be an online bookseller, right? So he's sitting on the ground and he's assembling books in a box. Mm -hmm. And he says to, to one of his recently hired executive, Jeff Wilkie, he said, Jeff, my knee hurts. Mm -hmm. And Jeff looks at him, Jack Wilkie, he said, Jeff, what the hell are you doing? Take a table, put the box on the table, then assemble it. He didn't know how to do those things. He was a <laughs> trader's assistant. Yeah, he was a trader's assistant. Drove out to the West Coast. So you learn those things. So I'm saying you got these five items, and the first two, if you don't have it, the rest won't count. Mm -hmm. It makes great makes great sense. Because number one will help you learn number three. Will have open up your eyes to number four. And you have yeah. to learn number five. What what would be your 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 sense of kind of best and worst pra practices on number five in terms of that capital allocation? Obviously, you're betting with big Yeah. Yeah, this one people need training. Yeah. The biggest people make mistakes and they go broke. Mm -hmm. Biggest people make mistakes. Right. And, and they are silly mistakes. Hmm. They are silly mistakes. They think they can, I mean, if you look at it, GE, it was an issue of resource allocation. Mm -hmm. The capital, G capital, had problems. And you're increasing it. Right. You created cash, your number of shares never changed. You put $100 billion of debt or some such number. Mm -hmm. Conditions went to hell on the outside. And one of your businesses declined it precipitously. You end up with a lot of inventory. And you put... $10, $12 billion in buying a company that turns out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Now, people will make mistakes. I'm okay with that. But you have an incredible debt. You have 50% market share in the world. And you bought a company and you put a ton of money out. And the result was $23 billion write off. That brought the company to its nadir. Mm -hmm. They're highly intelligent, educated, and using tons of consultants. Yes. So is the lesson that's too many, too, too big bets that were existential or the bets that you take should not be existential? What would be this? What's the silly part of that mistake? Yeah, so the volatility demands. Volatility demands that you going to have debt only to the extent that can sustain the extreme volatility. Mm -hmm. And the interest rates may go down temporarily, but I am absolutely clearly stating with you that inflation will be here, interest rates will come back 4% and higher, and there will be decline of the dollar. It has begun. Mm -hmm. I cannot predict the timing, but when I look at the forces, it's going to happen. People don't understand. America has to pay, not exactly a trillion, but close to it, in interest rates to the foreigners. Think about that. A trillion dollars a year, not quite there. It's about eight ninety nine. It is hard American dollars going to somebody, somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this metaphor for the dollar and, and America is true for global companies. If they take on risk, they have to be able to take the hit of what you say is going to be inevitable black swan events, volatility, um, yeah. and Will you survive that if that occurs? You need to know how deep the yeah. Mark, so, no, let me interrupt you. My point is, assume I'm wrong, but be prepared to manage the risk. Mm. That's how you do capital allocation. Right. Because I want to be wrong. There's no way I can predict everything correctly. But I do say, be prepared for the worst scenario. That's the best Look at the forces. Yeah. Look at the forces that will cause, and look at the forces that will nullify them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do that thinking. And then you go back to number one, engage in learning. <laughs> I'd love to see, I love to see this. It's interesting when you say return to number one, I, I, I saw your list as a circle. Uh, it felt to me like a continuous refresh uh, of discipline. Uh, the first two being the most important. You get that wrong, you can't get the other three. And because we're trying to grow, scale, and and manage risk and capital allocation, we end up having to constantly come back to first principles. You got it. So when I test CEOs, yes. you know, I test CEOs and yeah. my vote counts. It does. I try to search this number one first. Yes. I do. I get to the bottom of it. You can't fool. And second, I do check their judgment on people and the structure of jobs. Mm -hmm. I said, when you're a CEO, you can use all the specialists you want, but these two, you have to do them. Mm -hmm. I love it makes, um, once again, common sense that's not the least bit common because, not because of complexity, but what would <clears throat> be the reasons that mislead us from applying the these natural principles? Is it ego? Is it arrogance? Is it... No, no. Is it being busy? Complexity? There is a, no, there is a problem. Problem is... 
people think it's too basic. <laughs> so that's ego and arrogance. I have seen some of the best well-known speakers poo-pooing the right people right in the right jobs. Mm -hmm. Everybody has learning agility, but they don't know how to pull it out. Mm -hmm. They're just a buzzword. Right. If you look at these speeches, put 10 speeches randomly, you will not find the second element. Hmm. I guarantee you that. Right. That's right. And so when you take your journey around the world, coaching billionaires and the, and the leaders of billion and trillion dollar companies, it's interesting how coming back to those first principles, those the basics are disciplines that the virtuoso pianist there's a reason why she or he, I guess, practices their skill. Why is he virtuoso? Yes. Why look at a quarterback in your football? He doesn't yeah. have a time to think. Yeah. And what do they do all week? Practice. Practice. And they're basic practice. They're not some fancy stuff. They do <laughs> practice new techniques. I sure. will go this way, form that way, for some other way. Right. Right. We don't do that. So, Mark, I just have a article published in Fortune, and it is rehearsals. Businesses must rehearse. Mm -hmm. Rehearsal gets the mind, the brain aligned. You rehearse business in different set of variables. The the quarterback imagines zillion permutation combinations of the competition, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And all that thing get accustomed to, and then instinctively react. And you know in football, how dependent is the game on the quarterback? Absolutely. You can't be just making it up on the field. You have to have the scenarios that allow you to be proficient in so many alternative outcomes. Um, and the humility to just go ahead and continue to practice that scrimmage. Right. And within a game, they have failures. Constant. Inside the game they're playing, there are things don't go right, and then they come back. Right. You have to, to keep practice that. Mm -hmm. It's practice. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm excited about this circle of life, of uh, business life that you're describing uh, with these five dimensions. Um, and I, I look forward to you bringing that to the Academy, uh, that conversation there. It's let's do that, yeah, let's, we will let's do that. And so thank yeah. you for your time today. To, uh, thank uh, you, thank you. To have this conversation, much appreciated. Appreciate it.